Let's turn now to this portion we read, friends. <clears throat> John chapter 13. And we can take for a reference um, verse 2. We can read verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Mm -hmm. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. <clears throat> now at this stage, um, the Lord's uh, time on earth was uh, drawing fast to a close. This is uh, late on the Thursday night before Crucifixion Friday, if indeed it's not even perhaps the very early hours of Friday morning. And they are gathered in the upper room in that house in Jerusalem. And they are sitting at what has become known as the Last Supper, referring to the last Passover that God would uh, accept and that God would bless to his people. And following uh, after that, the Lord Jesus would institute the first Lord's Supper. Now, on the face of it, if we were to look into this room um, uh, from perhaps a window or something like that, it must have looked like quite a, an intimate fellowship of the Lord's people. There's the Lord with his 12 disciples gathered around this table. Now, uh, if you look at verse 2, the supper being ended, that's referring to the Lord's uh, Passover. It became sometimes known as the supper. But he hasn't yet instituted the first Lord's Supper. There is a sequence of events here, which I will explain to you shortly. But by the way, this is the scene that inspired Leonardo da Vinci, uh, when I'm sure most of you have seen that famous painting entitled The Last Supper. Uh, it's, uh, I believe, worth an awful lot of money. But in effect, that painting, uh, despite how famous the artist was and continues to be, I suppose, it's not accurate. And I'll explain something of that in a moment. Now, in this context, we likely find an answer to the question, a question we used to hear being asked and asked ourselves on more than one occasion in our fellowships when we began following and um, enjoying uh, the many fellowships we used to have throughout our communities and enjoying sitting at the feet of the great uh, leaders of our church community. And the question was this, when exactly did the Old Testament era end and the New Testament era begin? And there's always been a variety of views on the answer to that question. Or more properly put, when did the Old Testament covenant end and the New Testament covenant begin? Because that's the terminology that's used by Jesus on this occasion referring to the wine. In uh, Matthew 26, when instituting the Lord's Supper, he said, this is my blood. And now in our translation we have in the New Testament, but in the original it's in the New Covenant. My blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So it seems to me that there is a very strong argument that the changeover from the old covenant to the new took place here in the upper room, especially when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Now, um, I think from this point on, we can say that all of these people who are followers of Christ, they now belong to the New Testament covenant and the New Testament era, the gospel era. 
Now, it's easy to say that, but you know, that must have been quite a challenge for those who were living at that time, the believers, the followers of Christ. Because in essence, they really belonged to the Old Testament. They really belonged to the uh, Old Covenant. And when you think about how this developed and the believers had followed them, especially in the second part of the first century, they had to marry these two things together. The disciples had their lives already molded around the Old Testament scriptures. That was the only Bible they had. The first record of the Gospels didn't appear until much later uh, following this incident, and later still, the Apostles' writings, which are so, some familiar to us in the New Testament. Now, when they, they got the Gospels first, especially the Gospel of Mark, which was written first, when they began drawing in these writings, they were faced with the challenge of marrying all that in with what they already had of the Old Testament scriptures. So they had to take, for example, the Old Testament prophecies and find their fulfillment in the Gospels and in the Apostolic writings. And in particular, they had to find the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament and marry them in with developments that resulted from the first coming of Christ. Now, you know, when I was preparing this, I was, I was, by the way, I've, I've never preached, I'm going to preach tonight on Judas Iscariot. I've never done this before. And when I was thinking about it, um, I was trying to, to, uh, to, to imagine how challenging all this must have been for these first century believers, and especially for these disciples, because they had some guidance on the prophecies regarding the Messiah. There was quite explicit uh, texts of scripture, such as Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. They had very little clarity on prophecies regarding Judas Iscariot, but they were there. And I wonder how long it took for them to discover that these were actual prophecies regarding a Judas. Come to more of that shortly. Now, you know, in a certain sense, it's still a challenge for us to marry uh, Old Testament scriptures in with the New Testament or the other way round. In fact, that's what gave birth to what we call in the broader Christian church in the world, uh, what gave birth to dispensationalism. This is the name we give to people in the Christian church who believe, not as we do, in one Bible, a New Testament is a continuation of the Old Testament, a fulfillment of the Old Testament. No, they believe that there's an Old Testament era that focuses on ethnic Israel and the New Testament era that focuses on Christ and the gospel and the, and, and the apostles. And as it were, never the twain shall meet. And the only time that they will accept any of the Old Testament is if there's a reference to it in the New Testament. Other than that, it's just Jewish history. We call them dispensationalists. Now, that is still very common in the broader Christian church in many parts of the world. But what's fascinating to me is that the Old Testament was the only Bible Jesus had, the only Bible the apostles had, and certainly the old Bible these 12 disciples had. And it's fascinating, isn't it, that they could read that Bible and still see some of them very clearly the plan of gospel salvation in the Old Testament. We are saddened that people today can't even see it in the New Testament, but these men saw it in the Old Testament. In fact, we're told in one place that God 
preached the gospel to Abraham. Isn't that fascinating? Preached the gospel to Abraham. Well, if they were uh, able to recognize salvation and the way of salvation in the Old Testament, how much more clearly and how much more easily we should recognize the way of salvation in the fullness of the scripture set before us. Well, I want to look then, first of all, at this man, Judas Iscariot. He's called here in verse 2, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Now, it's not certain which Simon this was. There are a number of men called Simon round about this time in the gospel narratives and indeed in the writings of the uh, apostles. Now, some Jewish historians suggest to us that the name Iscariot can mean Tanner. Now, if that is the case, this Judas could have been the son of the man called Simon the Tanner in the book of Acts in chapter 9. Now, I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but if it is, that's tragic indeed. That's tragic indeed. Because that Simon was a good man. He was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a holy man of God and a good supporter of the cause of God. And isn't it always tragic, my friends, when the children of believers go far away from God, when they turn bad in the providence of God, and especially to the extent this man, Judas, went to. But in any case, in God's mysterious ways, Judas was called to be not just a follower of Christ, not just a disciple in the broader sense, but one of the chosen 12, the most intimate of the disciples of Christ. And for three years, he worked alongside 11 men, and he worked alongside them as far as we can understand how these things worked out every day, every day. And no doubt, he prayed with them, he preached with them, he worshiped with them, and perhaps he even performed miracles as they did. And I think that continues to happen to this day. Men still appear in the Christian church who go through the motions, for want of another way of putting it, through the motions of not only being followers, not only being office bearers, but of being preachers of the gospel. And time will show eventually that they are not at all followers of the Lord Jesus. It is a sad reality for us. Um, every minister of the gospel becomes a target for Satan. Every minister of the gospel potentially can have his call to the ministry undermined by the um, devices that Satan uses against people who serve God. But there are these people who do um, become apostate by their own decision. They abandon the things that they once believed. Now, the Satan that was so successful with Judas Iscariot is a Satan that is still a reality in the world today, and I'm afraid, in the Christian church as well. Meanwhile, the disciples were sitting here at the last Passover. Not one of them suspected that Judas Iscariot was anything different to themselves, that he was, in effect, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Only Jesus knew, and strangely, he knew before he ever called him. We read in John chapter 6, Jesus knew from the beginning who should betray him. 
Now, that wasn't from the beginning of their time together, the three years they spent together. Four times, four times, the Old Testament recorded details about Judas Iscariot. And it's also worth noting, and I can't figure out what the rationale behind this was, but the four occasions where there is this prophecy made about Judas Iscariot, all four appear in the book of God's praise, in the book of Psalms. Psalm 41, Psalm 55, Psalm 69, and Psalm 109. Isn't that a mystery? Wouldn't you think there would be someone perhaps in the prophecy of Ezekiel or someone like that? But no, it's found. These prophecies are found in the book of God's praise. And the most detailed of these prophecies is in Psalm 55. And I would like to read it to you. I was, this is the Messiah speaking in a word of prophecy through the psalmist. I was reproached by a man, mine equal, my guide, mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in company. Isn't that staggering? That Jesus, even in a word of prophecy, would call this man Judas Iscariot, mine equal, my guide. Then in Psalm 41, mine own familiar friend, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And that verse from Psalm 41 is quoted here in verse 18. So none of these disciples seem to have known any of this. They weren't aware of any of it. Now remember, these disciples, they knew Judas possibly all their lives long. It wasn't just for the three years that he was following uh, Christ. They would have known him all his life. Yet, they didn't seem to know that he was also a thief and that he was stealing from the kitty. He was a treasurer. Chapter 12, verse 6, talking about Judas, he was a thief, and he held the bag, that's the kitty, and he bare that what was put therein. He was helping himself. And he had the audacity on that occasion in, 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 in the previous chapter, to complain of the money that Mary spent on purchasing the alabaster box of ointment. He called it a waste of money. Why was this waste made? Why wasn't the money given to the poor? He was a scoundrel of the first order, a wicked man with a wicked heart. But nobody saw that wickedness except Jesus. You see, my friends, that's what the wicked often do. They hide their wickedness from other people. Now, sadly, the Christian church has a history of almost harboring wicked people with evil intentions. A history of it. It's happened again and again and again. We already quoted the saying, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now you won't find that, that saying in the Bible, but you will find the text upon which it is based. It came from the Lord Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Uh, mercifully, as a denomination, our history demonstrates that wolves in sheep's clothing have been rare amongst us. But nevertheless, let us remember, if these very able disciples, and some of them were very able, 
If they were fooled by Judas Iscariot, how easily can you and I be fooled in the same way? We cannot, my friends, ever escape the analysis God has made of the human heart, recorded in Jeremiah 70. Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, although we have, as Christians, we have an advantage, the advantage of grace in matters such as this, it doesn't change the potential of our hearts towards wicked thoughts and even wicked conduct. And furthermore, as we shall see in our next point, we are up against a formidable foe as Judas Iscariot discovered to his cost. And he will use every weapon in his armory to bring you and to bring me down, if he but could. Let me see then, choose us falling victim to Satan. Let's contrast two of the disciples just for a moment. Let's place them side by side. Both of them are far from perfect. Both of them can un come under attack from the same Satan. <coughs> one becomes his victim, one escapes his clutches. Judas Iscariot fell, Peter escaped. Now, although what Judas Iscariot did was a heinous sin, a heinous crime, in betraying the Lord Jesus, Peter, in what he did, in my view, was only a smidgen behind him. A smidgen behind him when he denied the Lord Jesus just a few hours after this. You see, Judas Iscariot was never a born-again Christian. It's no surprise he did what he did. But Peter was a genuine born-again Christian. And yet, we find him denying his Lord. Oh yes, my friends, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Years later, and this is a man of experience writing, and he's writing to you, and he's writing to me with a warning. 1 Peter chapter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's Peter saying to us, he almost devoured me. He almost devoured me. But why didn't he? Why couldn't Satan devour Peter as he devoured Judas Iscariot? Because, my friends, of what the Bible calls the intercession of Jesus Christ. Luke 22, Simon, Simon, this is the Lord Jesus talking to Peter using his other name, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. The roaring lion is seeking to swallow you up that he may sift you as sweet, but I have prayed for you. There's the intercession. There's what delivered Peter from the jaws of the roaring lion. And that, my friends, is what, deliver, what will deliver every believer from the clutches of Satan, the intercession of our beloved Lord. But there was to be no intercession when the roaring lion came after Judas Iscariot. Supper being ended, verse 2, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. And you'll see that it is put in a slightly different way in verse 27. Satan entered, entered into Judas. You see, there was nothing there to stop him. Nothing to challenge Satan. Nothing to prevent him taking possession of Judas. No intercession. 
No Holy Spirit, no covenant promise, no love on God's part. Judas Iscariot was left wide open to the roaring lion. Meanwhile, there they were, gathered at the Passover table. Now, it's worth noting, and we should notice, the order in which they sat or reclined. Now, you can't see this uh, from the narrative before us in any of the Gospels, and uh, you have to throw on commentators to, to find it, this order. Those who study these matters, they inform us. Now, this is where da Vinci, the artist, went wrong. He's got the disciples sitting on chairs at the table. These tables weren't like tables we have. These tables were low to the ground. They didn't have chairs. They reclined on cushions on the floor. So there were, it was an oblong table, and you had six disciples down one side of the table, six disciples down the other side of the table, with Jesus at the head of the table. Now, as far as we can tell, Jesus was at the head, John was to his right, there was a seat called the place of honour, and the place of honour was at the left hand of the person sitting at the head of the table. Now, wouldn't you expect that it would be perhaps Peter who was in the place of honour, or John? But that's not how it worked out. John was on his right-hand side. The place of honour was Judas Iscariot. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important to understand what happened next. <clears throat> Peter commented, commented to John after Jesus said in verse 21, one of you shall betray me. Now, they had no idea. They had no idea what or who was meant by this. So they panicked. Verse 22, they looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. They seemed totally ignorant of the Old Testament prophecies regarding Judas Iscariot. Now, meanwhile, John is pictured, verse 23, leaning on Jesus' bosom. So he's sitting immediately to his right, leaning upon his bosom. Peter sitting next to John, not on the left-hand side of Jesus, but next to John, two away from Jesus, leans over to John and whispers to him. He couldn't do that if he was sitting on the other side of our Lord. He whispers to him and asks, verse 24, ask him who it should be of whom he spoke. This so burdened our Lord that we read in verse 21, he was troubled in spirit. He was troubled in spirit. Now here's a question. Why was he troubled in spirit? It's not that Jesus didn't know that this moment was coming. It's not that he didn't know that Satan was sitting on the shoulder of Judas Iscariot. He knew all of that. He knew what was going to happen. So why was he troubled in spirit? Why was he bearing this burden? Well, the answer to the question is found in two texts. You look at the second part of verse 2 of this chapter. The devil put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Note that word, to betray him. And the second text is a text that's very familiar to you because you hear it at every communion. Read to you in the warrant of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, now, why did Paul highlight that idea of betrayal? Why didn't he say, as we may have expected him to say, the Lord Jesus on the night of his trial? 
or the Lord Jesus on the night before he was crucified. Why betrayal? And why was Jesus so burdened by this betrayal? When you think about it, this isn't unlike the question we often ask, why did Jesus weep at the grave of Lazarus? He knew what was going on. He knew that Lazarus wasn't permanently dead. He knew that his sisters who were weeping for him, that they wouldn't be mourning for very long, that they would soon have their brother back with them. So why did he weep at that grave? I will suggest an answer to you this, my friend, to that question in this way, my friends. Because of the burden he was bearing for all of humanity and the devastation that death would bring upon everyone who died in their sins. He saw in the death of Lazarus, the death of every sinner in this world, and especially those of them that died without salvation. So with the betrayal of Judas Iscariot, Jesus knew that multitudes of others in the Christian church in every age of time would be found guilty of betraying him. Not in the world, but within the pale of the Christian church. You see, Judas Iscariot, my friends, belonged to a unique category of people. These are people that mix with those that God calls his friends. Is not how Jesus describes believers? John 15, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Greater love than this, that man, uh, hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. Judas Iscariot spent three years going through the motions of friendship with Jesus Christ. He even expressed a quasi-friendship with him some hours after this in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is in Matthew 26. He came up to him. Hail, Master. And what does he do? He kissed him. He gave him the kiss of a friend. And Jesus acknowledged that's exactly what he was doing. Do you remember what he said to him? He looked at Judas and he said, Friend, wherefore art thou come? So with a kiss on his lips, with 30 pieces of silver in his pocket, he sold his soul to the devil and he betrayed his friend to his enemies. Many, my friends, that frequent the Christian church on a regular or a semi-regular basis, they consider themselves friends of God and friends of Jesus Christ. They do. You see, most of them think in this way, well, I'm not an enemy of God. I don't hate God. Therefore, I must be his friend. That's how multitudes of people think. And that's evidently how Judas Iscariot viewed himself. So what a warning we have here, my friends. One cannot be a true friend of God without being born again of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, without repentance and faith, and without loving the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and their strength. 
Now consider the outcome of all of this for Judas Iscariot. It's very difficult to join all the dots and put the four gospel accounts together on the sequence of events that took place. Now, one of the best authors, if you wanted to go read the detail on all of this, one of the best authors to read is a man called Eidersheim, who wrote a fantastic book. It's a classic called uh, The Life and Times of Messiah. Now, the sequence he suggests is as follows. Judas Iscariot was there sitting at the Passover table, but he wasn't present when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper shortly afterwards. Now, this is what he's suggesting. The Passover took place first, then the foot washing, which is at the beginning of this chapter, in verses 4 to 9, then the discussion on the betrayal in verses 11 to 21, then Jesus identifies the culprit, verse 26, he it is to whom I shall give the sop when I have dipped it. And after he passed the sop to Judas Iscariot, Satan then took total possession of Judas's heart and mind. Verse 27, Satan entered into him. That, my friends, was the cost of the betrayal. Judas Iscariot irretrievably lost forever while standing beside the Saviour. Is that not a tragedy beyond words? It's bad enough to think of anybody the Hitlers or the Paul Potts of this world being in a lost eternity. But when somebody is grasped out from the side of Jesus Christ and thrown into a lost eternity, that is heartbreaking indeed, my friends. Verse 27. Jesus said to him, that thou doest, do quickly. As if to say, it's all over, Judas. It's all over. My spirit shall not strive with man. Your time of opportunity is gone. And any human being lost to the pains of hell forever is a tra tragedy beyond words. But this is a particular tragedy, I believe. So it's not without reason that John recorded these words on the departure of Judas Iscariot. Verse 30. Immediately he went out, and it was night. It was night. As if the darkness of the night confirmed the darkness of that wretched man's soul and the darkness of a lost eternity. Oh, little wonder, my friends, that it is written of God. Seek your 33. I am no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Who could possibly find pleasure in tragedies like this? Then Ezekiel adds, what does give God pleasure? It's not the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's what gives God pleasure. And that's what gives sinners hope in this world. And that's what inspired the following plea from God in the same place in Ezekiel 33. It almost stretches the imagination to, to, to think of God in this pleading manner, turn ye, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? And let's not misunderstand, I know our time has gone, let's not misunderstand what evil means 
in God's eyes. Turn from your evil ways. There are many evil deeds done by people in this world. Many atrociously evil deeds. But as far as God is concerned, the greatest evil any man, woman, boy or girl could ever do is to reject his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, will be the greatest penalty of all. I remember when I was ministering in Glasgow, during that time there was that awful tragedy in Dunblane with Thomas Hamilton killed all those children and some teachers. And all the publicity around it focused on the loss of the children and the loss of the teachers and how evil Thomas Hamilton was in perpetrating that evil. And it got me so much, my friends, I had to say in a sermon shortly after that, when Thomas Hamilton stands before God in judgment, the first charge that will be read out against him won't be the slaughter of those children or the slaughter of the teachers, horrendous as that might be in our eyes, but the fact that he was a rejecter of the Lord Jesus Christ that is the greatest evil of all in the eyes of God. And when that's done, especially by those who consider themselves friends of God and friends of the gospel, that's what left Jesus here burdened and troubled in spirit. And that ought to leave us weeping. Weeping over loved ones who haven't yet closed in with Christ, who haven't yet been ensnared, we hope and pray, by the powers of darkness. So the call from Ezekiel 33, the call for repentance and faith, is an urgent call, an extremely urgent call to all that are still out of Christ. In fact, it's as urgent a call as the invitation of the gospel is warm, encouraging, and open to every man, woman, and child. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank thee that we are able to read these stories that have been recorded for our benefit and read them with appreciation, read them with a measure of horror when we think about the multitudes who are cast into a lost eternity because they reject the Son of God. We ask, Lord, that there will be no one present here, no one in our family circles, who would consider themselves friends of God and yet who are rejecting the Lord Jesus as their Saviour. Have mercy upon them. Have mercy upon ourselves. Glorify thy name, O Lord. Bring us all in under the shelter of the shed blood of the Saviour. For his name's sake. Amen. <clears throat> Stand to receive the benediction now, friends. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.